So thank you all for uh, tuning in to, to, to watch me speak to an empty room. Um, I wish you all were here because it would be much more exciting for me. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, to, to be able to address you all this morning. So uh, human beings <clears throat> are actually remarkably short-sighted and, and narcissistic. So in, in orthodox parlance, we refer to this as the doctrine of original sin, or as my boss is fond of it, too fond I might add, of saying the epistemic consequence of sin. We humans are trapped in time, and we always assume that our time, the period of time that we inhabit, is the most, right? It's always the most enlightened, or the most virtuous, or the most perilous, or the most degraded. And if you listen to the various factions who are filling our airwaves, and, uh, our inboxes, and our Twitter feeds, in the, especially this run-up to the November elections, we, United States citizens, less than 5% of the world's population are the leading edge of world history that is teetering on a knife's edge. We are either on our way to a fascist dictatorship by ethnic purists intent on destroying the environment, or we are headed to complete anarchy overseen by a federal government that usurps individual freedom and responsibility to make us all slaves of the state. And given the human tendency to exaggerate our own uh, importance and our own time, let's just say that I am skeptical. The reality is that despite the unprecedented use of the term unprecedented by our newscasters, our time is actually relatively ordinary. We're not actually facing a plague of sickness anywhere near what our ancestors faced. Our economic trials pale in comparison to what even our grandfathers and grandmothers endured. Even our persecution, even the social injustice in our society is kind of pale broth in the broad spectrum of history. And by the same token, while we may possess more powerful tools for both good and evil, we are not more wise, more enlightened, or virtuous than those who came before us. If we look at the pretty, the historical record, we are pretty much the same selfish, depraved, foolish creatures suffering from the epistemic consequences of sin that we have always been since we find ourselves in the opening pages of Genesis. To paraphrase Charles Dickens' opening line from A Tale of Two Cities, published only 160 years ago, it is always the best of times, the worst of times, the age of wisdom, the age of foolishness, the epic of belief, the epic of incredulity, the season of light, the season of darkness, the spring of hope, and the winter of despair. We always have everything before us and nothing before us. We are always going direct to heaven and always going direct the other way. Now, I don't want to minimize the difficulties that the church faces in the present, particularly in the United States. They are serious difficulties. I am struggling myself with knowing how to pastor a small rural group of scared Methodists in Ohio. But when you ask a historian to talk on ministry in a time of crisis, you're going to get a historical perspective. So this morning, I want to take you back in time to a point where everything really did fall apart. All that people trusted went into free fall. The church, the government, the economy, the institutions that people relied on and had relied on for generations failed. And then when faced with that crisis, something emerged among the people of God by the power of God. Our story begins with an empire in decline. <laughs> All right, we're maybe going to have slides to this. We'll see. Ah, 
Let's see if I can do it myself. Yes, I can, praise the Lord. All right. So our story begins uh, with this world power that is in decline. This empire at the center of Europe was struggling to maintain unity among its diverse and contentious populations and its various states, all with leaders who wanted to take power away from the center. There had even been secessionist movements in various regions, some successful, and different regions had begun dividing ideologically, developing different understandings for what they thought was a good society and a good religious underpinning. The institutional church was largely complacent and also, like human beings, narcissistic. It was obsessed with its own cultural significance, with its massive buildings that it was constructing, and for the crowds who were attracted to the salvation that they were selling. And they were selling it. Many of the so-called Christian leaders were much more interested in profit than in being a prophet. Now this crisis began, as all crises do, with the best of intentions. People wanted reform. They knew that the state of affairs in, in both the state and the church were not what they should be. There were too many glaring examples of corruption, too much abuse by elites, too much suffering by non-elites. And even those who benefited from these corruptions knew that the injustices angered God and cried out for redress. The problem was that the people could not agree on exactly how reform should be enacted or how much of the old institutions should be preserved. Should the abuses be reformed while leaving the institutions largely intact? Sure, it would be Surely it would be best to just get rid of the bad while maintaining the church's privileged position in the state and its structure, its leadership, its theology, its, its rich liturgy. That, of course, became the Catholic reforming position. Or maybe reform did require a change of leadership and structure and theology and liturgy, but, but we wanted to retain the position of the church within society. That was both the Lutheran and Reformed Calvinist options. But of course, those two parties couldn't actually agree on either the nature or the extent of the reform they wanted. And finally, there, was, though, there were those who thought all of it just had to come down including the position of the church within the state. And that was the radical option. And those folks were known as Anabaptists or rebaptizers by their critics, but, but they honestly just thought of themselves, since they didn't believe the first baptism was about, as just baptizers, or we might say Baptists. And with all of these options and competing factions, the stability of both the institutional church and the state was at serious risk. Now, there were attempts made to salvage what had been, right, to reconcile differences and preserve stability. On December 15, 1540, a secret conference took place between Catholic, Lutheran, and Reformed moderates. Baptists were not invited, the radicals, of course. And that group was able to uh, reach agreement on some of the theology, at least the doctrines of original sin and justification. And then encouraged by the results of this meeting, another meeting was set for April 5th, 1540. Delegates included Cardinal Contarini, a, a reformist Roman Catholic, the author of the Catholic Church's report on reform. It included Martin Bootser, the moderate reformer of, uh, of the church in Strasbourg, the moderate Calvinist, and Philip Melanchthon, Martin Luther's more shall we say, Irenic assistant. Baptists, again, being radicals, were not invited. They passed four articles without controversy. One was on the condition and integrity of humanity before the fall and of free will. 
The one was on the cause of sin and on original sin. They were able to pass an article on justification. But as it turned out, no agreement could be reached on the authority of the institutional church, on the church's structure, discipline, or sacraments. And when the agreement was sent back to the leaders of these various reform movements, these various ideological camps, it went nowhere. The bases of the various parties no longer believed in the sincerity or integrity of the other people in the other parties. So they would each go about their reform separately. Whatever happened to the institutions. The first group to address reform was the Catholic Party, calling a church council to be held in the city of Trent. And the council met then intermittently for, well, close to 20 years, from 1545 to 1563. And this desire for a universal council to settle the disputed matters had been requested by many of the reforming groups repeatedly. But half century of tensions prior to this council meant that the rift already between the parties, between Catholic and various Protestant reform movements, was beyond repair. No Protestants attended. And the Catholic party benefited from having an agreed upon structure, a council, to resolve internal differences. And there were conservatives and progressives, even within the spectrum of those who wanted to maintain as much of the institution as possible. Progressives, who were mostly Spaniards, wanted the authority of the council declared above that of the Pope. But they nonetheless agreed that the council could legitimately resolve disputes. The outcome of that dispute, though, was assured by the predominance of Italians attended. Of the 255 prelates who find, signed the official acts of the council, 189 were Italian. And the immediate uh, uh, result of this council was a tremendous boost to papal authority. Theologically, the council ended all possibility of reunion with Protestants. Now, it may be true that this council drew upon the best of its tradition, especially St. Thomas Aquinas for theology, but it's also true that some of the breadth and flexibility of, of medieval Catholicism was simply abandoned. While the Catholics were doing that, the Lutherans were having their own struggles within their own party. Luther had died in 1546, and Philip Melanchthon, that more Irenic uh, assistant of his, was forced now not only to head up the University of Wittenberg, which was the center of Lutheran theology, but the entire evangelical Lutheran Church of Germany. But the problem was, among some of Luther's associates, many were reluctant to accept Melanchthon's leadership. He was simply too moderate, too willing to talk to others. And so an opposition party formed, calling themselves the genuine Lutherans, claiming to be representatives of pure Lutheran doctrine. And the conflict erupted when the Philippists put forth a clarification on the doctrine of justification by faith alone, saying that while justification is a gift of forgiving grace by faith, not conditioned on obedience, nonetheless, a new life, which assumes obedience and good works, must spring out of this justification. And this, along with the idea that justification results in cooperation, human cooperation with God's will, released by grace, all of that was seen as a kind of lapse toward Roman Catholicism. And then in 1552, Mel Melanchthon was accused of agreeing with John Calvin on the way in which Christ was present in the sacrament of the Eucharist. So meanwhile, the state was attempting to deal with the problems of these multiple ideologies swirling around in different sections of the country. In 1555, they came up with a compromise known as the Peace of Augsburg. The solution, quius regio eus religio, which means whose realm, his religion, allowed these regional officials to choose either Lutheranism or Catholicism for their territories. And families were then given a period of time to physically migrate 
to a place where their opinions dominated. It kind of sounds like our uh, current system of social media, where, where opinions migrate to those who, who live in a, in a various echo chamber. That, however, that agreement, however, only recognized those two uh, ideological camps. It did not recognize either Reformed Calvinists and certainly not Baptists. That non-recognition of Calvinists made the Philippists accused of both Romanism and crypto-Calvinism vulnerable to charges of heresy. And that co controversy within Lutheranism continued back and forth for years after Melanchthon's death. But finally, in 1577, with the adoption of what was known as the Formula of Concord, the cause of the Philippists was finally destroyed in all territories that accepted this formula. The formula excluded moderate Lutheran positions as well as Roman Catholic and, Cal and Calvinist positions. And it was put together in a book with the Augsburg Confession and Luther's large and small catechism, which would be the standard for Lutheran theology for forever. Oops, there that is, Book of Concord, sorry. Now, why were the Lutherans so afraid of, of Calvinism? Now, part of the reason was that th these genuine Lutherans were anxious of this perceived crypto-Calvinism was the success of Calvinism throughout Europe, despite, or maybe even because, it was technically illegal. That Lutheran con conflict sometimes drove people toward Calvinism. One example one example was uh, Frederick III, often known as the Pious, he was the leader of a state known as the Palatinate. And he had adopted Lutheran reform in 1546 when he got married, but he got offended by these genuine Lutherans' polemics and began leaning toward Calvinist understandings of the faith. And when Melanchthon died in 1560, he switched parties and began to introduce moderate Calvinism into the areas he ruled. The following year, he, the following year, he um, authorized the development of what was known as the Heidelberg Catechism, which was completed in 1563. Now, this was Calvinist in its fundamentals. Many doctrines like predestination, however, were kind of de-emphasized in this catechism. And, and even more controversial questions about how Jesus was present in the sacraments were left deliberately vague. And it focused instead on the way of salvation, teaching the necessity of the new birth and assurance and holy living. But in other places where Calvinism was strong, political splits drove it away from any kind of moderation. And this was especially true where national independence movements were connected with religious ideology. In, 15, in 1556, the head of this declining emperor, Pyre, the one who was trying to hold this nation together, was Charles V. And he was finally fed up with trying to achieve unity in both church and empire. And he, so he abdicated all of his titles and went to live in a monastery. His son, Philip II, then became ruler of his territories in Spain, in the New World, and in the Netherlands. Philip, who had been raised in Catholic Spain, was a big fan of strong centralized monarchy, but he had little sympathy for Protestantism or the politics of this messy empire. During Philip's reign, tensions flared in the Netherlands over taxation, suppression of Protestantism, and centralization of the government. The Netherlands had always been a kind of religiously mixed part of the empire situated at the mouth of the Rhine River, the most important trade route in Europe, and every religious group was present there. 
So along with politically legal Calvinism and Lutheranism, or Catholicism and Lutheranism, Calvinism had also floated down from Switzerland in the Palatinate, and all of these were challenged by Baptists, particularly Mennonites, whose witness through persecution was powerful. In the midst of this civil war, or a war of independence, a synod was called by the Reformed Calvinist churches to settle a controversy that had arisen in the churches following the spread of what was called Arminianism. Jacob Arminius had been a theologian and university president who, while serving as prosecutor in a Calvinist heresy trial, had become convinced of the biblical soundness of the so-called heretical position. After his death, his followers presented his objections to some aspects of Calvinist teaching in a doctrine, a document called the Remonstrance. And they did this in 1610. It was an alternative to the mainstream Calvinist teachings. And this Arminian Remonstrance, this Arminian Remonstrance had five points. The first was that humanity could not save themselves by the strength of their own free will, but, but could respond to God's cooperating grace. The second was that God elected conditionally those he foreknew would come to faith through his grace and persevere in faith and obedience. The third was that Christ died for all humanity, although only believers benefit from his passion. The fourth was that grace is resistible. And the fifth that was that one can truly believe and still fall away from God totally and finally. Now these views were actually quite close to Melanchthon's and frankly to the Tridentine Catholic position. But all points of this remonstrance were condemned by the Synod. And thus Reformed Orthodoxy was established. The points of the Synod, sometimes referred to as the five points of Calvinism, are remembered usually by the mnemonic tulip. They are total depravity, which means there is nothing you can do. You are so depraved you couldn't even cooperate with the grace of God, even by grace. The second is unconditional election, that God elects from the foundation of the earth those he's chosen, and there's nothing you can do either way to be part of God's chosen. The second is limited atonement, which means that Jesus only died for the elects because it makes no sense for Jesus to die for the damned. Finally, irresistible, or irresistible grace, which means that if you're elected from the foundation of the earth, grace will find you and convert you. And finally, the perseverance of the saints said that because you're elect from the foundation of the earth, you will persevere. If you are a saint, you will make it to the end. The Synod, the synod um, completed its rejection of Arminianism on the same year that, perhaps not coincidentally, a civil war began in the empire, which was known as the Thirty Years' War. The issues that contributed to the Thirty Years' War are first the polarization and hardening of ideological orthodoxies to exclude consideration of ideas that had previously been considered debatable. Second, there was the alignment of ideological and ethnic and regional identities. And finally, there was the fact that these ideological factions were now armed. You see, religious tensions, ideological flare-ups had been breaking out into violence in different parts of the empire, often linked in the minds of the people to the defense of local autonomy or majority rule. In the free city of Donauwort in 1606, which was within the Bavarian territory, the Lutheran majority decided to bar Catholic residents from holding processions, which they considered a sacrilege. And this provoked a riot. 
Maximilian, the Catholic Duke of Bavaria, essentially called in the National Guard on this riot, taking up arms against the city, in this case, on behalf of the Catholics. And this willingness to resort to violence made the Calvinist uh, rulers in different parts of the country who were still a legally unprotected minority feel very threatened. So they formed a military league of evangelical union in 1608 under the leadership of the Palatine ruler Frederick IV. And that league prompted the Catholics rulers to unite in what was known as the Catholic League in 1609 under Maximilian, the Duke of Bavaria's leadership. So the tinder was all in place, and all that was needed was a match. That match was Bohemia, what is today the Czech Republic. It had become apparent that Matthias, the ruler of Bohemia, would die without an heir, and his lands would go to his nearest male relative, who was the Archduke Ferdinand II of Austria, a staunch Roman Catholic dedicated to religious uniformity in his lands. And this terrified the Bohemian nobility, who were largely Protestants. So in 1617, Ferdinand was elected to become the crown prince. The nobles, however, wanted Frederick V, who was the ruler of the Palatinate, the son of the founder of the League of Evangelical Union, that military camp. So when the Archduke Ferdinand sent two Catholic representatives to Prague in May of 1618 to administer the government in his absence, these Protestants seized them, subjected them to a mock trial, and then threw them out of a palace window some 50 feet off the ground. Remarkably, they survived, landing in a giant pile of manure. And this event, known as the defenestration of Prague, and those of you, that word defenestration is one you want to work into as many conversations as you possibly can. It just means to be thrown out a window. That is what began the Bohemian Revolt now, initially, Protestants were successful in their ability to uh, maintain Bohemia as a Protestant state due to the unstable conditions in the rest of uh, Austria. They even crowned Frederick V as king of Bohemia. But eventually, the Catholic League's army, which included a future philosopher, René Descartes, in its ranks, pacified certain parts of Austria, while the emperor's forces pacified other parts of Austria. And then those two armies united and moved north into Bohemia. Their forces defeated Frederick's forces in November of 1620. This defeat led to the dissolution of the Evangelical League. Frederick was outlawed from the Holy Roman Empire. His territory is given to Catholic nobles. And Frederick, now landless, made himself a prominent exile, currying support for his cause in, in places like Sweden and the Netherlands and Denmark. It wasn't long before other foreign powers got involved in the conflict for their own interests. Spain felt called to come to the aid of, uh, of its fellow Catholics while continuing to put down the Dutch struggle for independence. Catholic France, ironically, who being threatened on both sides by Catholic Spain on the one side and the Catholic Roman Emperor on the other, decided to fight with the Protestants for its own strategic reasons. And then Lutheran, Lutheran Sweden and Denmark, urged on by Frederick, this exiled prince, even apart from their own religious interests, fought on the side of Protestants to increase their trading position in the imperial states bordering the Baltic Sea. So this conflict, this civil war, then developed into a general war involving most of the European powers. It lasted for 30 years. Catholics killed Lutherans and Calvinists. Catholics killed Catholics. Lutherans killed Catholics and Calvinists. Calvinists killed Catholics and Lutherans. And everyone killed the Baptists because most of them were pacifists and hey, they didn't fight back. Entire regions were stripped bare by foraging armies. It is estimated that violence, famine, and disease wiped out roughly a fifth of the population of the empire. For a percentage comparison, 
to our own pandemic. That would mean not that only 177,000 deaths had happened as of yesterday's count, but that 66,200,530 people died. In this declining nation, entire regions were depopulated. Farmland returned to forest. People thought this was God's final judgment, that it was Armageddon. The negotiations that eventually ended this war began with a French defeat of Spanish forces in 1643. And four years later, it was formally ended with a treaty in Munster part of a wider peace of Westphalia. That peace did not solve any of the ideological disputes that had fed this conflict. It essentially told the various combatants to go back to their corners and stay there. It was modeled on the earlier peace of Augsburg, and it did three things. It continued the law that the religion of the prince would be the religion of his people, it allowed for migration for religious reasons. This set off huge migrations of populations within Europe and to the New World. And finally, it legalized three confessions, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, and Calvinist. Baptists, since they didn't have weapons or princes, were still out of luck. And at the end of all of this, society was in complete tatters, like nothing we can even imagine not even really after World War II. The world that the people had known before with the church at the center of people's lives was completely gone. The population was depleted, the economy was wrecked, the government was divided into tiny little princedoms. There's a hymn from this period that, that was written. I just wanna sing a couple of lines from it so that you, you know um, you can get a sense of how people experienced religiously this situation. The, the first two lines go, Jesus, priceless treasure, source of purest pleasure, truest friend to me. Ah, how long in anguish shall my spirit languish, yearning, Lord, for thee. Thou art mine, O Lamb divine. I will suffer naught to hide thee, naught I ask beside thee. In thine arms I rest me. Foes who would molest me cannot reach me there. Though the earth be shaking, every heart be quaking, Jesus calms my fear. Lightnings flash and thunders crash, yet though sin and hell assail me, Jesus will not fail me. And it goes on. It's a hymn that talks about what does it mean to cling to Jesus when everything else has gone away? The end of this war had established ideological purity in given regions. Everyone had to sign on the bottom line that they agreed. But even within these islands of doctrinal purity, a person could subscribe to all the right points and still live like a reprobate, and many did just that. Doctrinal purity, especially an emphasis on something like justification by faith alone, or simultaneously righteous and sinner, which of course were meant to focus on the individual salvation being apart from works, could definitely be twisted to lawless ends didn't necessarily produce the kind of societies pointed to in Jesus' teaching. But it was at this point that this broken, divided, poor, socially, well, less influential church began to get back to the basics of what it means to be the church. The basics of discipleship. Calls for further reform of the church, but not of its doctrine, but instead its life in the world started to be heard. And small communities of lay people began meeting to encourage one another in love and good works 
in all sorts of different areas and communities and ideological camps. Early examples of this seem to congregate along the Rhine River. The Rhine, which of course begins in Switzerland and ends in the Netherlands, had several reformed communities, uh, Calvinist communities along its banks with their concerns for holy living as a sign of election. And it also had a lot of concentrations of Baptists and their focus on Christianity as an alternative society. Furthermore, it was the major trade route from the Alps to the North Sea, and trade brought together people of every conceivable ideology, Roman Catholics, Anabaptists, Calvinists, Lutherans, they all had to mix. And it was within this environment that a new pattern of Christianity developed that was not a single powerful institution, but little tiny communities focused on the fruits of faith in the individual and on communal life. And a major tool for developing these fruits came to be small accountability groups. This movement is what historians now refer to as pietism. Now defining pietism is challenging because it is very complex and diverse. It is not a confession that you can point to certain doctrines. It's not an institutional church. But it is a way of understanding what it means to be a Christian, a way that crosses both confessional and church lines. It's kind of a collection of theological emphases, but it's not doctrinal. And as such, though, it has had considerable staying power. Pietism in its many versions was, to some extent, one answer to the question, after the collapse of a united Western Christianity, what comes next? This movement spread not through ideological systems or confessions, but through works of practical piety, through small devotional groups, through contact with other believers, and ultimately through some perceived connection to the divine. It distinguished between fundamentals of Christianity and opinions. And that enabled it to move and multiply across confessional and political borders. And although individual pietists were committed to certain theological positions, generally to the doctrines of their territorial churches, these commitments were just the lens through which they viewed their lived piety, gave language to articulate this vision of Christianity. But the language was not the thing itself. And so pietists did not restrict their fellowship to their own confession. And, and all confessions, from Roman Catholic to Lutheran to Calvinist to Anabaptist, were all impacted. Some of its marks include a concern, no, a concern for further reformation of the church worked out in the lives of believers and communities. A strong emphasis on holy living, a conviction that faith must become active in love, that a Christian can't simply just be declared righteous, but must actually be made righteous by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this marked a renewed interest in the action and work of the Holy Spirit. They expected a religious, quasi-mystical experience of God. The experience of the love of God and justification and the new birth was that new emphasis on the experience of the Holy Spirit. They also had a hopeful eschatology, hope for the world. Because the expectation that the Holy Spirit could work in the lives of individual believers was also an expectation that the work of God's Spirit could happen among communities of believers and societies of believers. If individuals could be called to repentance and by the power of the Holy Ghost be expected to repent, then societal institutions who are created by those same people could also be called to repentance and could be expected by the power of the Holy Spirit to repent. They believed that God could do something through works of mercy and mission and social reform. And finally, one of the major marks of this movement was the use of small groups to cultivate the Christian life. And in these small groups, people could anticipate the intention 
of God for human community. After the Thirty Years' War, it was the Netherlands that became the center of this, or the beginning of this movement. The Calvinist focus on holy living in the context of a church recognized by the state meant emphasizing this need for further reform. To extend the Reformation into the daily life of the people in society. And it was not meant to be a necessarily a critique of the first doctrinal Reformation, but, but this pietistic desire to extend its influence into the lives of people. Beginning in 1629, in the city of Leiden, there were small groups meeting for catechism and council outside of worship services. At the University of Utrecht, there was a professor named Gisbert Guetius who organized his students into small groups for the precise observance of the moral law, which is to love God and love neighbor. His new movement came to be known as Precisianism. Then there was a guy named Jadakus von Lodenstein, who had been a student of theology under Vietius in Utrecht, and then went to Franker in 1644 to study languages under a less dogmatic professor named Johannes Cosigius. And he then brought together Vietius' zeal for holy living and use of small groups with Cosigius' moderate German Calvinism. And so in Lodenstein's groups, any disputes over doctrinal issues were forbidden. The focus was to be on practical Christianity, the cultivation of Christian affections, of, of a Christian will, of God's will, and the following of the moral law. And these groups, groups began to spread. Theodor Unterreich, also a student in Utrecht and Leiden, carried the practice of organizing these small communities into the German Reformed Church. In 1665, he began house groups in Mulheim an der Ruhr. And during the eight years he spent there, these became the established reality of church life. And in 1668, he was called to Kassel, a much larger city, where he continued that same ministry. So we have it in reformed communities. Oops, next one, sorry. And then it made the jump into Lutheranism. With, the, with a person by the name of Philip Jakob Spener. Spener grew up on the borders of France in Alsace, trained by a devout grandmother who read devotional books to him by English Puritans, and one by John Arndt called True Christianity that claimed that it wasn't enough to be Orthodox to be a true Christian. Spener was convinced of the necessity of moral and religious reformation within Lutheranism, and so he went to study theology in Strasbourg, where the professors were most inclined toward lived Christianity rather than theological disputation. When he graduated, he became a tutor to the princes of the Palatinate, lectured at the university, and then spent a year in Geneva, influenced by the moral life and church discipline he found there, as well as by the preaching and piety of certain uh, preachers like the Waldensian Antoine Leger and, and a converted Jesuit preacher, Jean de Labadie. Spainer moved to Strasbourg in 1663 and was appointed the teaching pastor. And three years later, he became chief pastor of the Lutheran Church in Frankfurt. When he started this pastorate in Frankfurt, he was of the opinion that Lutheranism was being sacrificed to zeal and rigid doctrine. And so he began to initiate religious meetings in his house, which he called Colleges of Piety, where he would expound on the sermons from the previous week and open up the New Testament and, and welcome questions from those who would attend. In 1675, he published a book called Pia Desideria, or Earnest Desires for Reform of the True Evangelical Church. It was originally written as a preface to Arndt's true Christianity. But Pia Desideria gave the movement a name, Pietism. And the work served as a manifesto around which Lutheran pastors and laity began to be drawn into these small groups for spiritual encouragement. 
and it propelled its writer into some public recognition. In this work, he laid out the sins of the clergy, of the ruling classes, and of the laity. And then he made six proposals for the means of restoring life to the church. He wrote that there needed to be earnest and thorough study of the Bible in private meetings, little churches in, within the church. That the Christian priesthood was universal, that the laity should share in the spiritual government of the church. That there must be a knowledge of Christianity, but that it must be attended by practice as an indisputable sign and supplement to it. And that instead of merely didactic and, and bitter attacks on, on the people that one disagreed with, that we should treat them with kindness and sympathy. That there needed to be a reorganization of theological training of, 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 of pastors, giving more prominence to their devotional lives. And finally, there needed to be an entirely new type of preaching, a preaching for the heart in the place of either sort of rigorous argument or pleasing rhetoric. That, that we needed to implant Christianity in the inner or new man and see the, the effects of that in the fruits of a person's life. And this book produced quite great effects throughout Germany. Large numbers of Lutheran theologians and pastors were highly offended by this book, complaining that it was uh, borderline heretical and overly critical, but many of the critiques were too obvious to be denied. And so an equally large number of pastors began to adopt Spainer's proposals. In 1686, uh, he accepted the invitation to the first court chaplain in Dresden. The elector who uh, offered him the post was though soon offended by his uh, heart preaching and uh, discharged him of his pastoral duties. He found a position then at the court in Brandenburg, uh, the rectorship in, of St. Nicholas Church in Berlin. And in Berlin, uh, stay there, sorry. In Berlin, Spainer uh, found some ability to affect change. He was able to found a university in the community called Halle in 1694. And even though throughout his entire life he was exposed to the attacks and abuse of the Orthodox party within Lutheran theologians, the movement that he inaugurated increased. In 1695, uh, the theological faculty at Wittenberg formally laid at his charge 264 errors of heresy. It was really only his death that released him from these fierce conflicts. Nonetheless, there was a network spreading and a university established. Spainer's successor and the leader of the Pietist movement was a guy named August Hermann Franke. While studying at the universities of Erfurt and Kiel, he came under the influence of uh, Pietists. And during his student career, he made a special study of the Bible, Hebrew, and Greek. He finished his studies and became a lecturer at the University of Leipzig. And with the approval and encouragement of his mentor, Philip Jakob Spener, he founded a small group called the Collegium Philobiblicum, a, a college for friends of the Bible, at which a number of graduates met regularly for study. The emphasis was on practical application of what they read. He spent some months then in the city of Lüneburg as an assistant to a pietist superintendent where his beliefs deepened and then became a teacher in a private school. After a long visit with Spainer, who was at that time now still court preacher in Dresden, Franco returned to the University of Leipzig and began to give Bible lectures at the same time resuming these colleges of lovers of the Bible that he had started in earlier days. 
and he became a very popular lecturer, but his way of teaching almost immediately aroused opposition from some in the university, other professors. And before the end of the year, he was forbidden from lecturing on the grounds of his, quote, pietism. And that was how Franca's name first came to be associated with Spainer and with this movement. Since he couldn't lecture in Frank in Leipzig, he found work in Erfurt, another city, as a deacon at one of the city churches. And his evangelistic fervor attracted multitudes to his preaching, including Roman Catholics, which caused some controversy. The result was that after 15 months, he was commanded by the civil authorities in that city to leave within 48 hours. That was the same year Spainer was expelled from Dresden. Eventually, through Spainer's influence, Franca accepted a position to fill the chair of Greek and Oriental languages at this new University of Halle, which was being organized. Now, because the chair had no salary attached to it, he was appointed pastor of a church in Glaucha, which was a poor suburb of Halle. And there, for the remaining 36 years of his life, he worked as both pastor and professor. At the outset, he was profoundly impressed with a sense of his responsibility for the numerous outcast children who were growing up around him in ignorance and crime. Remember, everything had fallen apart. After a number of tentative plans, he resolved in 1695 to institute what was called a ragged school, a school supported by public charity, free to the students. It began in a single room, but within a year, he had to purchase a house, and another was added in 1697. By 1698, there were 100 orphans under his charge being clothed and fed, besides 500 children taught as day scholars. A boarding school was added, and the education given in these schools was strictly religious. Hebrew was included, as was biblical Greek, but Greek and, and Latin classics were eliminated. The school, schools grew in importance and added a publishing house, becoming known as the Franca Foundation. Hala became the center from which this pietistic understanding of Christianity diffused over Germany and the world. Under Franca's interest, Hala became the center for Protestant missionary efforts overseas. It wasn't, though, limited to Germany. It didn't stop at the borders of the former empire. In England, another man by the name of uh, of uh, Anthony Horneck helped transfer it into the high church sacramental Anglicanism. He had been raised in Germany in the Palatinate, immigrated to English after the Civil War, another religious war which caused the collapse of everything in society. He had studied at both the universities of Heidelberg and Leiden in the Netherlands. And when he came there, he became, received Episcopal ordination and joined the Anglican church. He was a committed Anglican in terms of his love for the first centuries of the church and his sacramental theology and practice. But he also was a pietist at heart. His preaching led to a small revival in London, centered both at his church, St. Mary Le Savoy, and another church that had formerly been the parish of Susanna Wesley's father. Most significantly, though, he organized what were known as religious societies. These were similar to Spainer's Collegia Pietatis, beginning three years after the publication of Pia Desideria. These religious societies, like Spainer's, were within the established Anglican Church under the supervision of its clergy. They encouraged devotion to the church's public worship and sacramental life. And the rules Horneck drew up for the guidance of these societies bear many of the marks of continental pietism. They included a desire to pursue holiness, charitable work, to avoid talking about controverted issues of doctrine or government, which of course had been the center of English civil war as well. The rule stated that the whole design of this society being to promote real holiness of heart and life. Now this did not deflect uh, suspicion from these groups, despite their high church devotional practices, 
they were often regarded as a threat. In 1702, uh, George Stanhope, who became the Dean of Canterbury, preached against these societies for what he saw as opportunities for lay leadership. Horrors. They, though, began with a considerable spiritual excitement, attracting many young people. And by the 1680s, attendance at the sacrament in London began to increase, perhaps due to the stress laid on it in the societies. They varied with the political uh, climate, and there was a partial collapse of the societies during the reign of Roman Catholic King James II. But it was these societies that would ultimately provide the matrix of relationships through which Moravians, another continental pietist group related to those Bohemian Protestants who threw the guy out the window, and the Oxford Methodists who were themselves derivatives of these societies. After the arrival of William and Mary as rulers of England, they spawned other organizations with philanthropic agendas. In 1699, they spawned the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge, which set about establishing charity schools to provide free, free education supported by members of these religious societies. They began to promote the establishment of religious societies and these schools in every parish in England. And in 1701, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel was formed, which promoted foreign missions. The first foreign member, corresponding member of the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge was none other than August Hermann Franke, who wrote in his letter requesting membership, I look upon these things as comfortable signs that the Spirit of God is now about a great work to put a new face on the whole Christian church. So what can we draw from this story of crisis and of these small acts of renewal? First, we can, we can um, say that the crisis of our culture is nowhere near the worst crisis that the church has ever faced. Second, we can say that no crisis is too big that God can't bring healing to and through his people. Third, we can say that it's not about the heroes. You know, when students of church, of modern church history, do this study, they often focus on the so-called major events, and then they miss sometimes where the Holy Spirit is peculiarly active. They're tempted to skip from the dramatic scenes of the Reformation in the early 1500s to the revivals of the mid-1700s. But the stories of the church's rise from the ruins of this division of war that happened in the 1600s was not about so-called great men. The people that I just listed for you, whose pictures I threw up on the screen, they were not famous like the great reformers Martin Luther or John Calvin. None of you, most of you, probably had never heard of any of them. None of them have denominations or theological traditions named for them, and all of them, though they served as, in my talk, as useful figureheads to remember what happened, are just stand-ins for the numerous lay men and women who gathered together to help form one another into disciples of Jesus Christ. The work that happened in the 1600s of crossing denominational barriers, establishing small groups for discipleship, promoting education, and missions turned out to be much more significant a reform of the church than even what Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin accomplished. That work created a network of pious cross-confessional communities that formed the matrix through which the revivals of the next century would emerge. And finally, we know we can de derive that history is not on our timetable. You know, those revivals that lasted from the mid-1700s to the mid-1800s, they did transform Europe and England and America. They resulted in the beginnings of free education, uh, the criminalization of slavery, and a host of other reforms. 
But it was not the case that people woke up in the midst of the ruins, humbled themselves, and revival immediately followed. From the beginning of these small reform movements in the early 1600s to the beginning of the revivals was nearly 100 years, more than 100 years. Those who began the work of renewal in the midst of the ruins of civilization never saw the fire fall. But it did fall. Brothers and sisters, it is the best of times and the worst of times, the age of wisdom, the age of foolishness, the epic of belief, the epic of incredulity, the season of light, the season of darkness, the spring of hope, the winter of despair. But whatever time it is, crisis or no, it is God's time. And it is time for the people of God to get back to the basics and make disciples. Jesus Christ. Thank you. So I suppose now is the time that I'm going to answer questions that people had from the talk. You want, you want to read some of them to me from the chat? I will as soon as I I'm um, okay, most of them are asking about whether this will be available. Uh, yes, I can, I can, I can make the, the slides available. And it will get posted on the course site. It will be posted on the course site, Heather promises. Um, Wow. Oh, get back to the basics and make disciples. Do you have suggestions? Best way to do so? I think um, the church always does it the same way. I think it, it does it really through house groups. Large worship services don't make disciples. The grand cathedrals that, the, the, that, that were built, uh, you, you know, there's a way in which you can think of the Reformation as a, as a church dispute over a building project because the um, particular selling of indulgences was in order to raise money to build the cathedral, the, Basil the cathedral of, uh, of uh, St. Peter and Paul in, um, in Rome. Uh, so, you know, as the church, we get distracted often by what looks impressive to the world. Um, when you look at these grand cathedrals throughout Europe, which are now mostly empty, and you look at what has happened in the pandemic to our um, much vaunted megachurches, um, that's not uh, the place where disciples really get made. The place where disciples get made are in small communities, in house groups, life groups, house churches. That's where the church began. That's where the church has always found its place of renewal in the midst of whatever crisis. You look at what the Chinese church has gone through. You look at, you know, the churches in Africa that are gathering under trees in small, in small communities. You look at what's happening in places like Mongolia or, or Kyrgyzstan, um, where the church becomes the church, the smallest unit of church, is not a big worship service. It's where... Two or three are gathered to encourage one another in love and good works. Do not cease to meet together as some are wont to do, says St. Paul. Can you compare the crisis then to now? I think there's lots of parallels. I tried to sort of draw some of those. Um, the separation of people into ideological camps, into their own echo chambers, that's certainly part of it. The uh, um, the unwillingness to, to, uh, to see any validity in your opponent's uh, perspectives, the demonization of others, the danger, of course, of, uh, of allowing um, riots to become uh, 
you know, to expand into, into, into much broader conflicts that draw in um, the whole nation. That's certainly a risk I see that that's what happened in that age. It's definitely a risk that we have right now. Um, the church could be the kind of uh, sinew that connects people across these uh, ideological camps. That's what happens after the, the collapse in the uh, by the mid 1600s, but it didn't happen before. Um, and it, you know that is always a danger. Um, human beings are are we're 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 really good at backsliding and very good at navel gazing. And despite Jesus' command to love our enemies, we're really good at not doing that. So um, finding ways that we, uh, yeah, I think there's lots of, lots of comparable things, you know, there's, a, but in another sense, there's always comparables, right? The world is always teetering on the brink of some sort of crisis. And by the grace of God, and usually by the action of the church, we manage to avoid the worst of it. Can you repeat the third lesson that we learned? The third lesson was that it's not about the heroes. It's not about the great people. Um, that, that it is, you know, we often think I've got to become Billy Graham to like do something significant for the kingdom of God or, or whatever, whatever, whoever your, you know, great person from the past is. But, but what, what, what brought about real renewal was, was yes, there were people who, who published books that encouraged others. There were people who, um, you know, started charity schools uh, or, or took in orphans. Um, but what they did also spurred on others to, to go and do likewise. There were people who began itinerant preaching and their itinerant preaching encouraged others to itinerant preach. Um, so that the, the gospel got spread. It's not really about the great person. It's about the people beginning to do the work of renewal and the making of discipleships in their own little area. And as that multiplies, it has a big effect, right? The, the, the kingdom of God is like yeast in bread dough. That's what it's like. And, and when we all want to be the, the great heroes, Instead of the people who are working diligently where we are to bring about change right there in the lives of actual physical people in front of us, um, we often miss what the Holy Spirit is trying to do and miss the growth of the, 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 the leavening of the whole loaf. So, you know, when, when, when one story, when John Wesley's father died, I was on his deathbed, and he called John to himself. He had been working for renewal. He had one of these religious societies in his parish in Epworth. He had started a charity school in his, in his uh, parish. And he had felt like basically a failure. But when, when, when he called John to his bed, he said, I will not see the revival, but I think you will. And I, we just need to take that long view that our lives are not irrelevant because we aren't the ones, right? We're not William Seymour. We're not whoever else you want to name, right? Um, God uses ordinary, nameless people to do the work of the kingdom. That's what the parables are all about. What do you see as the critical nature of the society for the propagation of the gospel? Well, what it, what it was, is it was the beginning of the Church of England deciding, whoa, we, maybe we should be concerned for people who are not English hearing the gospel. I mean, Protestants didn't do foreign missions until pietism came about. The first foreign missionaries were actually... The, the Moravians were the first to kind of send out foreign missionaries. Moravians were the descendants of these, um, those <clears throat> Hussite Protestants to, from Bohemia um, who were, you know, persecuted and kind of uh, 
you know, one part of this migrant community looking for a home, and they found the home on on one on the estate of of a of a pietist uh, a pietist uh, nobleman in Germany, and from there they they began organizing themselves because they had tensions into these small groups, and they had an ex a Pentecostal experience in that community, and and they began sending out people into the into in foreign missions. They started doing it when the community was like 300 people large. They started sending out foreign missionaries. And they sent out, for the first time, lay people as missionaries. Um, after that, you know, Hala begins, you know, relationships with some funders, begins a mission in India and, and England, the SPG begins, which is this sense that, you know, Jesus is not just for this like small little, you know, my little, my people, right? Jesus loves the world. So, uh, and, and honestly, the, the, the breakdown of the church after the Reformation, where it's really isolated, in this one uh, edge of the Europe, Euro-Asian landmass, Christianity is very, very uh, sort of almost ghettoized, really, to what happens today where it, nobody's in control of this movement of Christianity. It's worldwide. It affects every nation, tongue, and language. There is scarcely a an ethnic group that does not have some Christian presence in it today. And that is a direct result of the small work of the Holy Spirit that started in the 1600s. Can you say more about the idea of this current crisis not being the worst of times? Well, it's just, it's just a ludicrous statement to, to say that it is the worst of times. I can, I can, you know, the church throughout history has endured collapse, utter collapses of the civilization in which it lived. Um, the fall of the Roman Empire through the invasion of, of migrants, Germanic migrants, who, you know, destroyed uh, huge, you know, all, the, the entire government, every, every system of that Roman Empire that people relied on was gone. There were, no, there was nobody sending out checks, you know, to prop up the economy. That, that ended. There were no people meeting in the Senate in Rome. Um, famines, like we can't imagine. Plagues, even the, the, the uh, of disease that, that killed numbers so far in excess of what we're thinking of right now in America. Even 1918, I forget what the equivalent would be, but it, uh, in terms of percentage of the population that died in the, in the flu pandemic there to what is happening today, it, you know, we've been through a lot worse than we're going through right now. And it's just, we need, I'm not saying that this isn't bad, it is, and it has unique, um, you know, uh, difficulties associated with it. But the church has endured far worse. The church is enduring in different parts of the world far worse right now. You know, you don't want to be a Christian. I mean, maybe, maybe you might. I mean, you would be uh, like in China right now. It's not great. In parts of India right now, not great. In northern Nigeria right now, not great. What we're going through in this country right now is, is it pales, pales. Now that's not to say that God can't take what we perceive as our crisis and use it to humble us, to refocus us on what is essential to what the church is, and to actually bring about true renewal. I believe wholeheartedly that that can happen, um, even, in, even in what is a relatively mild crisis. Do you have any book recommendations on house churches? Oh, yeah. Well, um, well, well you can buy my book, which is on the band meeting. Um, 
there are there actually are lots uh, of very practical uh, books. Um, uh, Kevin Watson has written a book on Methodist class meetings. Uh, I've written with him a book on uh, on band meetings, which are you know confessional groups uh, for renewal. Uh, there are um, you know historically, uh, I mean uh, the the history of uh, of of uh, Spanish movement and these movements and and of the religious societies. I can, if if you want to add, if you're if you're looking for sort of academic books, I can point you to those. I don't have them off the top of my head, but I can also point you to those. How does this presentation speak to doing ministry in crisis that is not internal church crisis, but in the world the church is called to serve? Well, the world the church called to serve in 1648 had collapsed completely. And the church had to figure out, without social prestige, with an economy in ruins, with um, uh, a fifth of the population dead, how to actually be the church. And this is an example of one way in which the church found out how to do that and the results that followed through the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, how can we meet in small groups during quarantine without Zoom or WebEx? Meet with Zoom and WebEx. Fine. You can encourage one another to love and good works over Zoom. But unless I knew, most uh, places were allowing groups of 10 or less, which is basically a small group. So you could also meet in person pretty easily. In, in our little church, our rural church, we have both. Uh, we're, we're starting both Zoom small groups and we have uh, one that is still meeting face to face. Can you share what kinds of reformation that we needed 21st century or present? I mean, I think the reforms that are needed today are are very similar to the reforms that were needed uh, in the late 1500s, early 1600s. I think the church has largely become um, self-obsessed with its own, um, you know, bigness and popularity, um, and uh, has taken its eye off the task of actually making disciples um, for the business of church. And um, what was the question again? I lost it. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I lost it. My powerful. Similarities, I guess. Is what oh, can, the kinds of, what kinds of reformation that we needed 21st century or present? That we, yeah, I think we need, I think we need similar reformation, a reformation that that isn't about what makes you a Christian is uh, attending your you know, church and worship on a Sunday morning, which is becoming less and less frequent uh, as, the, as the years go by, uh, that what is expected, but that it, it actually becomes your full life. Um, and having, I mean, that's what the reform has to become. And it's not about, it's not only about a, a particular experience, um, it is about a, a, what the transformed life that comes from that experience. And it's about creating real community and actually like really loving your neighbor as yourself. Knowing your neighbor for that matter. If pietists are so great, then why do they not have mega churches? <laughs> well, because megachurches are not effective means of making disciples for Jesus Christ. They're only effective means of creating bigger megachurches and enriching um, celebrity pastors. What about the racial tensions we are facing right now? 
Do you think that the mention of this not being the worst we've seen has the possibility of minimizing the current crisis? Um, I'm, I intended to minimize the current crisis. Um, I do think that, yes, we have racial tensions right now. They are not as extreme as the racial tensions that we had um, you know, during uh, slavery. Even in this country, let's just talk about this country. They're not, you know, bad as the, the, the racial tensions that, that existed, you know, that, that, uh, that inspired Gabriel Prosser. They're not as bad as even the racial tensions that were going on in the 1920s and 30s, right? I mean, they're bad, but, but we're not, we're talking about degrees. And they do give us, they should inspire us to, uh, to work towards real reform of loving our neighbor. And that includes across ethnic divisions. And the same conflicts, like we, we think of Europe as just white people, um, uh, but what broke down the empire was also ethnic divisions. Um, People began hating other people for being ethnically different from themselves. They were, it was tribalism. And, you know, that is a, that is a human condition, the result of sin that must continually be opposed and, uh, and, and fought against uh, within ourselves and within our society. Uh, I don't, I don't see it ever going away in that sense, but our, our awareness and our commitment that it is opposed to the kingdom of God, our commitment among the church, that, that such is opposed to the kingdom of God, um, needs to become paramount. Right, we will take this as our last question. Um, what is a good source to examine what happened in the North African Southeast Asian Church during the 1600s? North African Southeast Asian Church in the 1600s. Um, short answer is not my area of expertise. The 1600s in the North African Church uh, is is a time when Islam is completely dominant in that area. Um, Southeast Asia, we're talking about, um, I mean, the, the Christian presence in Southeast Asia, so, you know, Vietnam and, and I mean, it's not huge. Um, there, there, there are very small pockets of Nestorianism and Jesuits have begun going in that direction. Uh, and establishing churches, though I don't know about Southeast Asia so much. Thank you, Dr. Kisker, for this morning's plenary. Um